Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now begin the session titled A Giant Leap for Mankind, The Economic and Social Impact of 5G. The moderator for this session is Mr. Stephen Engel, Chief North Asia Correspondent, Bloomberg Television, and the speaker is Rajiv Suri, President and CEO of Nokia. So please welcome them a big round of applause. Good morning, everybody. I am Stephen Engel, and thanks for participating in this, uh, what should be a very good uh, conversation with Rajiv Suri, entitled, A Giant Leap for Mankind. Uh, the economic and social impact of 5G. We've all been waiting, of course, for 5G and what it's gonna, and the transformative power that it might bring. Uh, I'm just gonna read you a couple of quotes from some people who uh, make some predictions. Uh, Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkoff says 5G will have an impact similar to the introduction of electricity or even the car, affecting entire economies and benefiting entire societies. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. Uh, also, Intel's 5G head, Asha Keddy, says, seeing 5G was like putting people on the moon. So we're really building up expectations, aren't we? And I'll read one more quote from a person who is sitting behind me here. I believe that we are on the cusp of not just a technological revolution, but a productivity revolution. That is Rajiv Suri. He has been the CEO at Nokia since the sale of its handset business to Microsoft in 2014, but he has held other positions uh, at the Finnish company since 1995. Uh, he saw the incredible rise, of course, of Nokia uh, in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Also, the rejigging then of priorities, and now, the revival, if you will, of Nokia. Without further ado, let's welcome to this podium Mr. Rajiv Suri, CEO of Nokia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stephen. It's a pleasure to be here in Seoul. It is in the nature of the human being to face challenges. Uh, it is in the nature of our deep inner soul just as salmon swim upstream. Not my words, Neil Armstrong's, the first man on the moon. He said it in 1969, but nearly 50 years on, the sentiment could not be more relevant, particularly for Nokia. Next year, we will show a new way to swim upstream. Working with Vodafone Germany, Audi, and PT scientists, we will take wireless technology further than it has ever gone before and install a 4G network on the surface of the moon. The base station will weigh less than a bag of sugar, and we will get it there as part of the first ever commercial moon landing. The end result will be a live HD video feed of the moon's surface, open to all, broadcast to a global audience of billions. And the base station will beam huge amounts of data, vital for lunar research, back to Earth. And some people ask, you know, why? Why bother? To them, I say this, yes, for science. And yes, to some extent, for publicity. But most of all, because it is in our nature to face challenges head on and search for solutions. Nokia has been doing this for over 150 years. And in that time, none of humanity's great advances, from walking on the moon to curing diseases, have been easy. They have been triumphs not only of science, but also of sheer political and social will. Today, in 2018, we, we stand on the cusp of another such advance, something that we're already talking about as an entirely new entirely vital part of modern infrastructure, alongside road networks and power grids, 5G. Before I go into why 5G is so important, uh, let's take a step back. Putting 4G on the moon, like we will next year, is a good opportunity to assess what it has achieved back on Earth. 
it is fair to say that the impact has been significant. It has opened the door to entirely new types of business models. Uber, Netflix, Airbnb, cloud computing, the first steps into the Internet of Things. And yet, despite all these advances, can we really, hand on heart, say that computing, the Internet, even mobile technology itself have driven intergalactic increases in productivity and GDP? It may seem that way, given the differences in the way economies work now compared to, say, uh, 10 years ago. But the stats say different. In the past 70 years, productivity growth in the U.S., uh, the home of the new Internet economy, remember, has actually fallen sharply from around 3% per year in the 1950s to around 0.5% today. In fact, since 1970, the time of the third industrial revolution, productivity growth has fallen to roughly one-third the rate of the previous 100 years. In other words, even with all those supercomputers, the internet, social media, and even with 2, 3, and 4G, we have been working harder and harder with more and more tools, and our reward on at least one metric has been, well, not much. Until now, 5G will change all that. It will solve the productivity paradox. Let me tell you why. Each generation of mobile technology has made our lives more, well, mobile. 2G made phones wireless, 3G made email wireless, 4G made the entire internet wireless, to the extent that if any of us reach into our pockets right now, within 10 seconds we could be booking a table for dinner this evening. Each step of this path has been defined by speed. The faster you can transmit and receive data, the more you can do with it. But 5G is different. It is different because it is not just the next logical step down that same path. It is not 4G, but faster. And that is important, because while 4G may have made the entire Internet wireless, it has not necessarily made it affordable. 5G will change all that by cutting the cost of delivering every gigabyte of data by up to 80 to 90% at the very moment that data consumption will go through the roof. That is a big deal for movies and entertainment. And it is where the consumer business case may lie. Because commuters and people on the go will have far more freedom to watch what they want, where they want, instantly. But extrapolate that principle beyond movies, beyond consumers. If, if data is far cheaper, then then all sorts of other uses begin to emerge. Industrial, medical, computational, particularly when combined with 5G's three other distinguishing features. First, it is massive, with up to 1,000 times the capacity of 4G. And that makes it fast, fast enough to stream whatever you want in the blink of an eye and fast enough, too, to support entirely smart offices where every device is wirelessly and seamlessly interconnected. Second, it enables what is called ultra-reliable low-latency communications, the ability to transmit data and instructions instantaneously, meaning that surgical robots, for example, or driverless cars can respond to what they see with zero delay. And third, it enables massive machine-type communications. So computers and robots can talk to each other, generating, exchanging, and processing data among themselves with human oversight, but without human intervention. Meaning that uh, entire households or production lines can operate pretty much autonomously. Sounds great, right? The problem is, it's all a bit theoretical. So the researchers at Nokia Bell Labs came up with a simple way to demonstrate this tech. A platform on robotic, 
auto-correcting arms. Roll the ball onto the platform, and sensors can predict its course and stabilize it. And I'm going to pass you over to Jason from our 5G team to show you the trick as it would be in some 4G networks. In this first demonstration, you can see on the screen here behind me, we're showing the current latency of what would be a 4G network. It's around 90 to 100 milliseconds. And on the right-hand side, you'll be able to see this line move as we move the ball on the plate. So what I'm going to do is move this ball right now, and we can see the oscillations here tracked on this graph and how long it takes for the robots to collaborate with each other to get the information they need to balance the ball on the plate. Not bad. Not bad at all. But imagine that this responsiveness was not being used to roll a ball, but to drive a car, or to pilot a drone, or even to insert a stent into an artery. What would a 10 seconds delay mean then? No, we need something faster and more responsive. So back to Jason. Then we're going to switch into 5G mode. And we can see on this graph here that we've now gone from around 90 milliseconds to around 3 milliseconds, so much, much lower latency in the network. And I'm going to do exactly the same again. And we can see that we only took one oscillation there to correct the ball. That's more like it. Complete responsiveness. And machine accuracy to the fifth decimal point. This is quicker, more powerful, and crucially, more multi-purpose than anything that has gone before. But you know, don't take my word for it. Researchers, including from uh, our innovation arm, Nokia Bell Labs, have concluded that 5G will become what is known as a general purpose technology, or GPT. This is probably the most exclusive club in the world, open only to those technologies that have a profound and widespread economic and social impact. The wheel, electricity, the combustion engine. In other words, it's a pretty big deal. The World Knowledge Forum could dedicate all of its speaking slots across all venues to exploring exactly how big and still not get through it. I've got only some 25 minutes, more like 15 now, so I'm going to choose just one example of 5G's potential. I considered healthcare, 5G ambulances, medical grade devices in the home, and so on. Seoul being Seoul, I considered smart cities with traffic streams redirected automatically, waste disposal only when necessary, or municipal services delivered in entirely new ways. But I settled on smart industry. And I'll tell you why. It is because a recent study from the World Economic Forum showed that Korea already has more industrial robots per head than any other nation. Six robots for every hundred human workers. On top of that, the Korean government has been extremely proactive in paving the way for future change. The Manufacturing Industry Innovation 3.0 strategy, published a few years ago, urges businesses to adapt quickly to new technology. And Nokia's own work with local companies has allowed us to see, up close, how adept they are at implementing that strategy. So we can see that Korea is already a super advanced and ambitious manufacturing economy. Efficiency and productivity have already been optimized, and there is a correspondingly high bar for demonstrating added value. 5G will clear that bar, and then some. So let me paint you a picture of the future based on one of Korea's trends and one of its most valuable exports, car manufacturing. We know that automation is more common here than just about anywhere else. But you know, walk around a car plant, and you might be surprised at just how many people there are. Yes, I mean, robots do all the welding and all the painting, but it is people who attach the doors, people who install the engines, people who put those plastic sheets over the seats. Don't get me wrong, these are highly trained professionals, experts at what they do. But human error is called human error for a reason. And 
in an industry where components are expensive and profit margins are wafer thin, any way to reduce waste and increase profitability becomes even more valuable. That's where 5G comes in. The high speed, low cost, low latency, and massive machine type communications that I mentioned earlier combine to unlock a new generation of working practices. The fabled fourth industrial revolution. First off, there will be a huge increase in the number of robots and the capacity of those robots. They will be able to take on more varied tasks, tasks that need judgment. At the moment, a robot that fits a wheel onto an axle can only do so for one type of vehicle. If you want to get that same robot to put a wheel on, say, a truck, it cannot, because it is programmed for a certain weight and certain dimensions. 5G will enable built-in AI, so machines can learn how to do the right thing with whatever is put in front of them, taking on far more advanced tasks, making manufacturing safer for humans and faster and more efficient for businesses. But it is not just about robots. How about automated drones that scan new deliveries of parts and direct them to where they are needed? The very essence of just-in-time manufacturing, or flexible production lines so that urgent projects are automatically fast-tracked, or intelligent repairs where machines predict where they are about to break and direct human engineers to see exactly what has gone wrong. Or those engineers themselves given augmented reality equipment that allows them to look through the solid metal casings and into the nuts and bolts of any industrial machinery, or zero tethering, where machines are completely independent of wires or network cables, allowing them to be redeployed instantly. Sounds great, but this is no dreamland, you know, miles off into the future. It is here and now. And Nokia is already working with BMW and others to roll out this technology into today's factories. And ladies and gentlemen, automotive manufacturing is just one example, one manifestation of 5G. There would be similar upheaval elsewhere, in all elements of business, entertainment, and public services. It's a true game changer. Uh, but here's the thing. It won't just fall into our laps. If we are serious about harnessing 5G's immense potential, we all have a role to play. So today, I would like to share with you three ways for Korea in particular to fight for this positive, more productive future. For business, don't be afraid to try new things. Look into how 5G can unlock cost savings and productivity gains through automation, through cloud computing at the edge, we call it edge cloud, and through better security. There are countless ways to improve existing working practices if you are willing to embrace change. For the government, keep your foot on the pedal with 5G-friendly legislation and regulation. Keep incentivizing innovation and take advantage of trusted tech partners like Nokia. We would be more than happy to advise you on possible ways to support the fourth industrial revolution and to create jobs. And my third recommendation is overarching, something we can all work towards in our own ways. When President Kennedy, JFK, wanted to establish national leadership in the space race, he knew he needed to change things up. It was not enough to have the knowledge or the people or the belief. You needed the infrastructure, the system. For JFK, the answer was the Apollo program. For us, the answer is a network architecture for tomorrow, far more advanced than today's. We call it the Future X architecture, capable of what is called zero-touch network slicing, allowing individual users to tailor their networks to their needs without having to lift a finger. This is 5G's skeleton key. It opens the door to an incredible range of services for every conceivable customer all entirely bespoke 
and all potentially cheaper than today's networks. So the smart factory we were talking about earlier could have one slice for its drones, one for its robots, one for augmented reality apps, and so on. Network slicing is the only way to fully exploit 5G. And there's only one way to be sure of getting it, end-to-end. -end. One trusted partner providing you with everything you need to make the jump to 5G, uh, from hardware to software, uh, consultation to IP and optical networks, uh, wired networks and, and wireless networks. The numbers are incredible. Compared to a multi-vendor model, a network from one end-to-end -end supplier can be 40% more economical and 10% more reliable and can bring new services to market one year quicker. And we at Nokia are the only ones who can deliver this end-to-end -end portfolio across all major markets on planet Earth. We're already working with Korea's three biggest telcos, SKT, Korea Telecom, and LG U Plus to make this happen. The only non-Korean networking company to be working with all of them at once. So, ladies and gentlemen, 5G is a step change, a step change for the ages. But it is also something else. It is a step change for today. The step change uh, we need now more than ever. Let me tell you what I mean. This is an almost unique moment in history. Behind us stands a period of unprecedented technological growth. Uh, the first, uh, the second, and third industrial revolutions changed the world of work. But they also changed the world itself by bringing first uh, cities, then nations, then continents closer together. Only four or five generations back, and it is not only possible, but probable that our ancestors would have stayed in the same towns for their entire lives. Now, uh, I stand in front of you today, born in India, raised in the Middle East, having lived in Europe, Asia, and Africa, with children in the UK and the US, my wife's company in Singapore, now in my fifth year as CEO of a Finnish company. Advances over the past century have brought us closer together, with extraordinary benefits for individuals, businesses, and society as a whole. Innovative technology implemented on a large scale makes the world a better, more peaceful, more prosperous place. That is what is behind us. But in front of us, if we are not careful, stands an era of increased difference, of entrenched inequality and intolerance, of trade wars and protectionism. Uh, I'm not in the business of blame, and I do not intend to start now. But what I will say is this. The choices we make today will define how society evolves for generations to come. Do we want to stick our heads in the sand and ignore the potential benefits of 5G? Or do we want to do all we can to usher in a new age of global technology-driven trade, uh, driven by uh, trusted partners, with 5G as an entirely uh, new type of critical infrastructure, doing for global living standards what the steam train did over two centuries ago? Research suggests that worldwide, 5G could unlock over $12 trillion of new revenue and 22 million jobs. It could help achieve every single one of the United Nations' 17 sustainable development goals. And according to the World Health Organization, could save millions upon millions of lives. But it goes even beyond that. Earlier, I mentioned the failure of previous industrial revolutions to spark uh, the sort of productivity gains that people expected. So we asked the researchers at our own Nokia Bell Labs what we might expect from 5G on that front. Their findings were remarkable. With 5G as a key enabler, their modeling shows the United States achieving a major productivity jump somewhere in the five-year period from 2028 to 2033. And when I say major, I don't mean a couple of percentage points here and there. 
I mean a leap of around 30 to 35 percent. Similar to the golden age of productivity and wealth creation that we saw during the 1950s. And this is not limited to the US. Any nation that embraces 5G, that sees its potential and backs it, China, Korea, India, Germany, could expect to see a similar productivity windfall. Ladies and gentlemen, these gains are eminently possible, but they are not guaranteed. We must fight for them today, not tomorrow. And that brings me back to what Neil Armstrong said. It is in the nature of the human being to face challenges. How right he was and is. Challenges bring change, positive change. The type of change that we as humanity rely on to move forwards and make things better for everyone. But 5G is more than the next challenge. To me, it is the next moon landing a giant leap for mankind. We owe it to ourselves to bring it to market sooner, better, and wider. Nokia and Korea can get there together. So let's blast off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, interesting insights into the world that is coming and, of course, the challenges. Uh, I guess I'm going to go right to a question that we had in the, in the pre-session there with somebody at the table, uh, really focusing in on what is going to be the true value of 5G. I mean, we all know that it, we can stream our Game of Thrones almost instantaneously and we can, for the consumer, but really, as you just mentioned, their productivity is going to be uh, the key here and whether it does facilitate a higher level of productivity at a time right now of rising protectionism and productivity and competitiveness really in the crosshairs. How do you see uh, 5G helping us transcend these, this world right now that is putting up borders? Yeah, I think that, uh, Stephen, thanks for the question. So I think that, uh, in fact, the greater opportunity is on the industrial side, you know, to get this productivity leap across many vertical industries, right? So we talked about the smart manufacturing example, but whether it's precision agriculture or it's uh, autonomous mining, or in fact driverless cars, or just healthcare. I mean, we know that we spend a lot of money around the world on after the fact healthcare. So let's just play out a couple of examples. Imagine that there'd be a 5G ambulance. Uh, someone's had a heart attack on the street. The person's, you know, the ambulance has been called, the person's in the ambulance. What happens today? Um, he or she is taken to the emergency room, the ICU, then they start to figure out the test and what's going to happen. Uh, and there are some conditions like heart conditions where every second matters, right? So imagine that same person's in the ambulance, you do all of these, you have miniaturized medical testing devices, you do a number of tests, I'm, I'm talking not just ECG, but you do a number of tests, uh, and then you send all this data to the emergency room before the patients actually arrive there. 4G can't do that. So you want to have 4G ambulances because that data transmission is just a lot of capacity where you need 5G. Let's take another example in healthcare. Uh, insurance costs are going through the roof. Uh, very expensive, especially in the US, but many other parts of the world. Uh, imagine we all start wearing uh, medical grade continuous monitoring devices. I'm not talking the fitness devices that we have today that measure a few things, but they're not medical grade, right? Nice, but not yet medical grade. So imagine that they are medical grade where you can measure you know, diabetic levels, oxygen levels, stress levels, uh, more than the obvious heart rate, etc. cetera. Uh, and we're all waiting it because what happens is when we go to our doctors every six months or three months or whatever it is, then we do a battery of tests, but there's a lot of void between these consultations. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lost data, but if you were continuous monitoring device, you get an alert to the doctor and there is a continuum of data around myself before I land up doing a static test on the day. And if I've had a, an omelet with egg yolk, my cholesterol is going to show through the roof on that day, but not over the three-month period, just as an example. So the point is that uh, 5G is required for that too, because there is no capacity 
if millions and millions of people start wearing these medical grade devices and beaming all this traffic up to the air. So I think whether it's uh, agriculture or pharmaceutical drug discovery where the bottleneck is clinical trials, it takes us seven to 10 years to you know, come up with a drug, it's very expensive, or it's precision agriculture or autonomous uh, mining where it's not safe for, uh, for human beings to, to drive mm -hmm. those large vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, just, it's going to touch. I don't think we're going to sit here in five or 10 years and say, you know, there are the tech sector and the rest. Every company is going to have to embrace digital and technology. What is the time frame that we're talking about? Let's get into the logistics. You and I, I believe, are both in our 50s. Are we going to see the true realization of what you're talking about? Yeah, we are. So uh, the, the specific timelines are, we will see commercial 5G this year. It's starting in the United States. So US is, is we're, as, as we sit here today, we are shipping thousands and thousands of base stations, the equipment required to fire up 5G uh, to our US customers uh, this year already, in the next uh, few months. So I think it's US, Korea, we know around springtime, we'll look to launch 5G networks. They did trials at the Olympics. They did they? trials at the Olympics, and some yeah. of the uh, things that were showcased were fantastic, uh, stunning. And then you have China, which will do it at scale somewhere around you know, the end of first half 2019. Then you have uh, Japan, which of course wants to do it for the, the Summer Olympics in 2020. Uh, you're going to get some Middle Eastern countries that are going to be starting first, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, UAE. You have the Nordic countries, they're always first to these things. Yeah. Uh, we like being first in Finland, but you know, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, uh, basically Scandinavia, Norway, uh, and then you'll get Australia. So these are the, the early lead countries. And interestingly, even though we didn't see 4G in India for a long time, uh, I think that it could be that India will be one of the first countries after this first wave to also get there because just the sheer consumption of data has grown like 95% right. or so in, in, in just There's you know, a potential one. there to kind of leapfrog the middle technologies. I think there is a potential, yeah. In, in India, right. And remember, the 4G will not go away. 4G will coexist with 5G. And you'll, of course, need spectrum for this. The other thing about 5G is that it is the first technology in wireless ever that has a very broad range of spectrum coverage, which, which we didn't have prior to that. Before we get into how Nokia is going to really push all their chips into this sphere, we need to kind of look back at the history of Nokia. Um, what is it, 153-year history, something like that, started as a, a pulp mill. It kind of represented, at the time, the economies that were uh, growing. And of course, we know Nokia built the, the big surge uh, for the, in, during the tech bubbles in the late 90s, and everyone had a Nokia handset. But then there were some missteps, obviously, uh, as you know, embrace Symbian rather than Android and, of course, iOS. We know about that, but now you're having a revival, yeah. if you will, as you talked about the end-to-end -end solutions. Is this, how is this critical to Nokia's survival and next chapter in your long yeah. history? When a lot of people, I've been saying, hey, I'm going to talk to Rajiv Suri, the CEO of Nokia, and let's face it, a lot of people say, they're still around? Right, right. Yeah. You are very much around. We are very much around. We're, uh, you know, whatever, 25, 26 billion dollar uh, revenue company, you know, sort of 30 plus billion dollar market cap. So we're still fairly significant, fairly large. So I think Nokia over the 150 years plus history has been able to be bold enough to, to change constantly. Right? So we started with pulp and paper mills, you know, rubber and everything else that came be between then and, and mobile devices became the champion of mobile devices. That didn't work out, so in 2014, we completed the sale to Microsoft of the mobile phones business. We turned around Nokia Siemens Networks, which was the joint venture that I was CEO of, which was a combination of the networks business of Nokia and Siemens. And then in 2014, the second step of our transformation was to acquire the 50% of Siemens that we did not already own. Then we became fully Nokia. Uh, and then we became a portfolio company that had three businesses, Nokia's networks business, Nokia's technologies business, which was basically the advanced technologies, the intellectual property of devices and networks that we didn't sell to Microsoft. And the third was here, a mapping business. Uh, and so we said, you know, what next? So we started looking at 2025. This is around 2014-15. We said we use this strategy 
approach of, uh, of future back. What kind of company we want to be in 2025, let's work back from then. And effectively, we had become a mobile network specialist. We were focused, but the world had changed, and especially with the run-up to 5G, we needed to be a player that was end-to-end, -end, right? That, that didn't just have wireless, but had wired and had you know, IP and optics and everything else that went in, inside of the network, but also above that, you know, software and, and a positioning for the enterprise. And so we looked around and we said, uh, we had a number of options, and we chose to acquire Alcatel Lucent. Uh, and that doubled our revenue and massively increased our scope, right? And, uh, and so, effectively, if you go back 10 years for the network sector, there were probably about 10 players. And now there are three that operate at scale. And uh, we acquired, over the years, the Nokia business merged with Siemens. Then we had Motorola in 2011. We acquired Panasonic's networks business. And of course, uh, through Alcatel Lucent, we acquired Alcatel Lucent Nortel. So all the others are now consolidated by Nokia. So, and all of this has been bold deal making, right. but also, of course, operating. And, and so now we're an end to end company that focuses on three things. One is networks, riding the wave of 5G. And 5G will be very much an end to end network. If you think about network slicing, the examples I gave, you need to be end to end to provide that slice to, to our customers. That's customization. Right? Uh, well, Slightly. what we want to do is, to avoid customization, what we want to do is, is to automate it. So okay. it'll be zero touch, network slicing, okay. automated. So okay. if you and I want to sit here and, and give a thousand slices, we cannot customize for a thousand slices. All right, we can't, gotcha. you know, so we'll, we'll make it zero touch. How does the Alcatel Lucent deal increase your competitiveness against the likes of the rising powers, like a Huawei? Uh, or the ZTE, which are your direct competitors in this end-to-end -end solution. I, Alcatel, Lucent, I would assume, you would give you a slice of the United States. Yeah, first of all, it, it took us from a distant number three to number one in the US. US became our largest geography, so US is part of it. It substantially increased our share in China. But then it gave us a scope that only two companies have. So us and Huawei, at scale, have that end-to-end -end scope that others don't have. Right? And I said end-to-end -end is important, especially in the wave of 5G. But the distinguishing feature about Nokia is that we're the only ones that operate in all markets at scale with an end-to-end -end scope. So I think that's a, that's a massive differentiator that we have. Plus, the end-to-end the -end portfolio allows us to go to the enterprise. And I talked about all these use cases. And of course, a lot of these use cases are going to be unleashed in the industrial space. And so enterprise is our fastest growing business. And then we have a business called software which is all the stuff that sits over the network layer. And so we're moving into software. And finally, we have a licensing business, which is one of our fastest growing businesses uh, as well. So very much more integrated company with, uh, with growth areas mm -hmm. and some areas that grow uh, you know, less so. And you still have handsets, but that's a license deal, it's right? It's a license deal. HMD. HMD. So there are still Nokia handsets out there. It's well, just yep. you collect royalties from the licensing. We brand and... and uh, uh, so brand fees as well as royalty on the intellectual property. What do you see as the biggest hurdles, the biggest challenges to the deployment of 5G? Obviously, it's a massive cost that are being absorbed or uh, you know, paid for by a lot of the operators. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the biggest hurdle is uh, just a skepticism. You know, around this time of a new technology, we're always skeptical. Like, what's 4G going to be about? I remember these debates in 4G. What's the business case? What's the use case? What really? Well, basically, it made mobile internet happen. And now you have the same kind of skepticism. How much should I roll out 5G? You know, what should be at scale? Should I just do a so-called wedding cake network that I can just, you know, maybe be in the cities yeah. and not? So you get that skepticism. And my answer is that hey, this has been a supply-driven economy uh, industry for decades. You put the network out there and those use cases will come. So the use cases on the consumer side will be uh, low production cost of video, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. I mean, I'd love to sit with you here and watch a basketball game feeling like I'm in the stadium right. as opposed to you know, distant because you feel like you're in the stadium. If you've got glasses whose form factors will change, I mean, the VR headsets we see right now will too change cumbersome. over time. It's too cumbersome. That's a bottleneck, but that'll change over time. So AR, VR for live entertainment, live sport. But then on the industrial side, we don't have to invent the use cases. 
I don't want to bother in inventing the use cases because there are hundreds and hundreds of use cases that the vertical companies know that they have. They know the problems they want to solve, and, and there are so many examples. They're often very trivial. There's one example we, I came across, which is very interesting. Uh, we're trying to put a network in, in Nebraska between wind farms because the use case is that uh, an eagle cannot be killed. Yes. Because it's the national it's, bird it's and it's protected. It's, a, it's protected. It's a big fine. So it's a very simple use case to put you know, a low density network just to do uh, autonomous drones that actually can inspect and, and visualize and can, can predict some of these things over time. So the use cases are plenty. They're small. They're not just driverless cars and autonomous trucks. There are, I would venture to say, there are thousands of use cases. And so just take that leap of faith <laughs> and let's go build it. How about the price point? Is it going to be too prohibitively expensive? Uh, no, it won't be, because uh, if you look at total cost of ownership, it will not be, simply because you know, it's uh, 80 to 90% cheaper on a cost per bit level. And what really matters to us and why we optimize our networks, we do it for cost per bit. So if I'm going to put out this network for this much video, how much is it going to cost me? And this is going to be orders of magnitude lower than 4G today. Automation, you talked about that. In these economies, in this part of the world, that puts a lot of pressure on employment. And employment is a very key political concern. How do you address those issues? You know, I, I think that is a problem. But uh, if you look at the digital industries over the last 20 years, they've actually had more employment than the physical industries. So even though they've gotten a lot of productivity, they've generated more employment, something like 29% you know, growth of employment whereas for physical industries, it's about 20%. So it's, it's you know, somewhat higher. Um, so it proves that automation doesn't take away jobs. I think what it does is it displaces occupations. So we will, as a society, have to be prepared to, if the truck driver is going to lose his or her job, what do you repurpose the skills for? Right? So, so there will be more jobs but jobs will be displaced. And so that is the issue that we have to Education deal with. is going Education, to be... Education, reskilling, upskilling, those are going to be the important things. At the introduction, I ran through a number of quotes about 5G. This is one of my favorites, uh, also from Asha Keddy, Intel's 5G head. Now, this is not my words, but they say, your IQ, I'm just going to use you, your IQ may be much higher than mine, which it probably is. <laughs> um, with all that data and tech that 5G gives me, what advantage then will you have? This could commoditize intelligence. W would you agree with that, or there still needs to be execution on that intelligence, on that data? Yeah, there needs to be. I mean, it's, again, we at Nokia, uh, don't just believe that AI will take over and sort of this, this notion of uh, robots getting so much more intelligence. Which if you actually think about where robots are today, the intelligence is maybe a touch more than a cockroach, right? So there's, there's a long way to go in terms of robots getting that sort of intelligence where they can not just coexist, but, you know, surpass human intelligence, this notion of super intelligence. So, you know, my view is that uh, we believe in human augmented intelligence. So a lot of these use cases I'm talking about is to make the factory workers' life better, uh, safer, and so on. So it's you know, humans working with machines in a way that humans use their capabilities to the best of their abilities, and machines use it to the best of their abilities for repetitive tasks, uh, something that, that uh, is less prone to human error. So the combination of the two is, I think, what's powerful. Mm -hmm. I want to open up uh, soon to the floor, so get your questions ready uh, for Rajiv Suri, and I will see your hands pop up. Um, but let's talk about the, the moon project. Why? Because we can. <laughs> I, I, I guess the thing is for science. Um, so we're going to do this around Q4 of 2019, together yeah. with our partners, PT scientists, Vodafone, Audi. There's going to be a couple of these Quattro rovers that are going to go to the Apollo 17 site um, and get a lot of information of, of the moon's surface. And then you'll be able to give that back to the, the landing, the, the what we call ALENA, which is the Autonomous Landing and Navigation Module. And then you can beam that back to Earth. So you'll get a lot of so it'll data. It'll be a live stream, but it'll be 4G. But how does this going to illustrate the potential of 5G? Or does it? 
Well, I think if you can do it with 4G, the, the enormity of 5G and the ability to do that with just a you know, much higher capacity would, uh, would be so much better. Right. But I think what it'll prove is that we've done a lot with 4G on, on Earth, but you know, how about doing it for a science project to go and get this data from the Earth, beam it back to the uh, Earth, and get a lot of knowledge of, of uh, you know, the moon's surface. Right. There are questions from the audience. This is your chance. You've done a number of different, I'm gonna leave it, let them think about that. You've talked about the different acquisitions that you've made in the, in the divestitures as well, um, to kind of refocus towards that end-to-end -end solutions on 5G. What else is needed as you, the leader of this company? You know, it, it's, we want to continue to be end-to-end, -end as well as deeper in some areas. So even since we acquired Alcatel Lucent in 2016, we've made, you know, about half a dozen acquisitions on top of technologies that uh, make things more interesting in the network. You know, example of deep field, which gives us a lot of deep uh, analytics around the network that is not possible to do with manual probes and, and things like these. So we'll continue to acquire companies that, that uh, you know, strengthen our strategy. So things that get us stronger in the enterprise, uh, technologies and businesses that make us stronger in software, that help our customers generate more revenue. Because 5G is one thing, but you want to use 5G to generate more revenue because the issue of our sector for our customer base is, how do I take that 5G and generate more new revenue? So those are the sort of acquisitions that we are still, you know, bolt-on adjacency-driven acquisitions that we're making. Who are going to be the leaders? Are, are they going to be defined by national borders like China or the United States, or is it industries? I think both, and of course the race to 5G is happening precisely for that reason. I think the leaders will be one that, uh, ones that get it at the country level, provide the spectrum, because for our industry, spectrum is the lifeblood of anything that we can put on air. Uh, those will be leaders that, that, that get it, don't charge too much for spectrum, yeah. Don't get too greedy around, uh, around Spectrum, but just... We learned the lessons of the 3G li we did. licenses. But then there are some countries that are at it again. I mean, Italy just finished its auctions at something like 7 billion euros, and, and that was fairly expensive. So Finland, on the other hand, gave uh, licenses and au auction Spectrum for just 75 million euros. So I think I like the latter one better. You think it's misguided that. then for government to try to see that as a cash cow? Don't take it as a short-term thing. This is a long-term thing. This is about productivity of your country. This is about you know, underpinning uh, productivity, but also artificial intelligence, robotics, data. All of this sits on a network, 5G. Without 4G, I, I don't think we'd have the smartphone experience that we all have today. We would not see Netflix or Airbnb or Uber. And the same thing will happen in 5G. Companies will evolve from places we don't know. Uh, there'll be a whole new ecosystem that will come up. And there will be a massive, massive increase in, in productivity in industries across the board. Mm -hmm. You talked in your speech about your multiculturalism. Your, you've lived in a number of different countries. How important is that in shaping how you see Nokia adapting to the 5G world? It, you know, it's, it's, it, it's going to have to transcend borders, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it's very important. Nokia is a very diverse company. We, we've uh, grown in the recent past through acquisitions. I think if you look back at 2014, uh, before and after, 99% of people that are Nokia today did not have a Nokia badge uh, before 2014. So that's how transformative the experience has been. And you know, we come from different cultures. So I believe a lot in, in a single unified culture. I've spent a lot of my own time on driving the right kind of culture at Nokia, but I'm a huge believer in diversity. I, and I think that's a competitive advantage you know, over the long term. How about safety of the internet with 5G? Does this also speed up the nefarious acts on the web? Uh, absolutely, it can. How do you guard against that? I, I think you know, mobile malware is growing at a, at a very rapid pace. Malware meaning sort of yes. threats and issues. So I think there will be a a lot of focus on security. This is also why we're end-to-end, -end, because the one theme that we provide end-to-end -end isn't just a better total cost of ownership, uh, but it is automation and it is security. Because if you give a network slice to the autonomous drone or for healthcare, 
we're using virtual reality to do remote robotic surgery, et cetera, et cetera, the last thing you want is a security hassle that brings the network down. So I think uh, that's why our focus is on designing our products for security. Just as you design your product for quality, we design our products for security right at the first instance. We don't give our source code to, to anybody um, so that you know, there's nothing like backdoors that can happen and so on. But I think security is, is going to get a premium over the next few years. Not just security, but also privacy. We right. at Nokia, we don't use data you know, to, to, to monetize new sources of revenue. We've always believed that that will not be the case, even when we were in the consumer business. Jack Ma, I remember talking to him at Alibaba, and he said, data is the new oil. It is. People are going to be fighting for it, oh. unfortunately. Oh. You agree? 100%. It's going to be the new oil. It is the new currency, especially as all this AI is only as good as the data you can, you can use. And, uh, and deliver that to the machines to make them better and better. So if you were an entrepreneur, like many of them in the room here, where would you be investing to capitalize on the boom that you're talking about? Uh, tech is a good Nokia, place to invest. Right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> apart from Nokia, <laughs> tech is a good place to invest right now. Yeah. I mean, just, you know. Questions? Here's your chance. Did you do it? Over here. Mr. Suri, thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, I have a question that kind of branches off of the human error and the automation error that might occur from 5G. So right now, I guess a lot of the industries and governments are kind of at odds in if an automation error occurs or an accident occurs where human lives are at risk, who will take the blame? So obviously, uh -huh. Nokia and other telecom operators will have to cooperate with uh, other companies and in industries to make the most optimal uh, 5G uh, advancement. But in the end, when the technology and when the uses occur where human lives are at risk and an accident does occur, what is your stance from, an, from Nokia in terms of who will have to take the blame or who will have to take the responsibility? Accountability, yes. Right. Accountability, and are we going to be all lawyered up? <laughs> well, ultimately, it is the provider of the service that will yeah. you know, take the blame and there'll be these back-to-back -back contracts, et cetera, but ultimately it's the, but on the whole, I mean, if you look at the point on safety, it's a very good one. We lose, what, 1.3 million people globally to car accidents every year. So on the whole, even if we will see instances here and there through automation, uh, you know, we can easily halve it or reduce it close to zero with, uh, with autonomous, autonomous driving over time. Vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. 1.3 million people, that's, that's a quite significant number that we still have globally. Yeah, but is accountability going to be an issue, do you think? I think it will be an issue because legislation is, I mean, the thing with legislation, it always follows technology, right? Reactive. So it's reactive, it's a bit late. I mean, even with driverless cars, I think we'll get there by way of technology, but we may, we may have to catch up in terms of legislation, right? right? And I think one of the things we have to do about legislation is that I don't think we can just have legislation that's vertical, right? So I'll do it for healthcare as we digitalize, or I'll do it for this industry as we digitalize. All of these issues of accountability, they are kind of common. So we will need to find a way to get this vertical matched with the horizontal. We need to see ministries that, that look across the entire spectrum of digital to solve some of these common issues, whether it's safety or security or, or privacy. Uh, it's not like this yeah. in different silos. What then would be, in your vision, the unintended consequences of 5G? And that is usually what happens when the government step in and over-regulate. We've seen it with blockchain and ICOs, uh, cryptocurrencies, I should say. Um, shut it down because we don't necessarily understand it or understand that potential. Do you see the unintended consequences of all this data and all this instantaneous access uh, having some drawbacks that the governments and regulators might crack down on? Of course, one of the consequences is what we spoke about. Uh, automation will displace jobs. Occupations will change uh, over time. And it's easy to say that, you know, we should just reskill the people and upskill the people, but talk to the truck driver and explain that. See, that gets votes. Sorry? That gets votes, getting a job back to the truck driver or to the coal miner or to the... That's right. But that's a risk. You know, technology is going to come no matter what. 
So the thing is, we have to prepare in societies for this big upskilling and, and uh, change of occupations that, that's inevitable. It gets votes, and we've seen it with Brexit, and we've seen it with the US, etc. but we have got to prepare for that change. So that, I think, is, is a, sort of an intended consequence or an unintended consequence that's going to happen. I think the second is just that uh, we are myopic, and, and uh, by nature, humans are myopic. That's right. And as an industry, we, and I'm talking about our industry and, and our customers' industry, that we're not brave enough to drive 5G for the industrial use cases. And we just look at what we are familiar with, which is a consumer case. Hey, let's put a bit more speed out there, a better user experience. Maybe there'll be a lot of capacity, but I don't know how to transform to go and get this industrial opportunity. It's just massive, and it's a big change, so I'll let it go. Yeah. And then over time, new players will come and cannibalize and disrupt. But let's not ignore the industrial opportunity because that is the greater opportunity. In fact, we have said that in our customers' business, you know, the operators, uh, we see a 150% increase in revenue in their enterprise businesses from 2018 to 2028 and a 200% increase in EBITDA from the industrial opportunity. And that's worth fighting for. Yeah. So, so in enterprises, this is more than just, hey, IT department, you roll this out. Absolutely. No, this goes up to you. This goes, uh, absolutely it does. Yeah. Anyone else, questions? We have a few more minutes. Back up here? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed you guys up there. Hi. Yeah. Hi, yeah, thank you for your lecturing today. Yeah, I have a question that uh, mm, the 5G is commercialized uh, by, from like next year, 2019. So then probably Nokia uh, started uh, preparing for the next generation, I guess, probably. So uh, what's the Nokia is focusing on, uh, what kind of element to, in, to be improved on 6G? And then, yeah, in the next <laughs> generation, it could be difficult. Yeah, 6G, are we talking 6G. about that yet? Well, the thing with uh, 5G is that we started working on 5G maybe 2007 or so. So you're usually starting work way earlier in terms you of... You can see the evolution arc, Absolutely, right? in yeah. terms of research, because at Nokia Bell Labs, you work on 10x problem solving. So at the moment, what I'd say about 5G is that there's going to be just so much capacity coming from, from 5G that uh, it, will be a, it will be a cycle that will be longer than previous cycles. Like 3G and 4G typically have peaked around seven to eight years. So it grows, the investments grow, and then it starts to go like this. And I believe for 5G, because of the broad range of spectrum, and because it's just not for consumer, but it's also for industrial, that it'll peak around 10 years plus. So I think my point is that 5G will last longer than the previous generations of technology. But you know, when traffic starts to grow, so let me give you an example of consumption of data. In the United States, as an example, something like 100 gigabytes is consumed uh, per month per user. So if I'm in the US across everything I do at home, on my wireless, my devices, etc., I consume as a household about 100 gig uh, per user per month across networks, wireless, wireline. We anticipate that by 2025, that will go 4x, right, to about a 400, 380, 400 uh, gigabytes per user per month. But let's imagine that virtual reality becomes something that, that scales. And so we get 20% of penetration in the world around virtual reality. Right? So we're all using VR for different immersive experiences. That number of 400 per user per month will be more like 6,000 gigabytes per user per month. So even if we say there's a lot of capacity for 5G, I can see a time where even this will fall short. So from 100 to 6,000. 6,000. Because VR is not a linear trend. It's an exponential driver of, of growth in traffic. You're a believer in VR. I am, but the form factor will have to change. Because you're oftentimes discouraged by the first experience. experience. Yep. And I've done it. It's fun. It lasts. 10 minutes or so, but I could see a lot of commercial applications and enterprise applications. You mentioned a sporting event. Y you could sell more than 100,000 tickets to a Super Bowl by putting people actually in the stadium and watching the Super Bowl. Yeah, or think about education. We talk about MOOCs and these massive open online courses. Imagine if we could experience that through virtual reality sitting 
at home and feeling like I'm in the classroom right. from multiple locations. So it's, it's medical, it's uh, you know, these sporting events or live entertainment, but also places where we don't expect it to be right now. Now, uh, is the latency still something that it needs to be worked The latency out? is very important. Of course, 5G will solve that with this one millisecond of latency, because if not, uh, my head moves in a way that I start to feel nausea, yeah. right? So you, you, you have to solve for latency. We have time for one last quick question. Someone right there, really quick. All right, um, thank you for the um, insight on 5G and the future it might bring. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, you mentioned the um, healthcare and science, but uh, what business sector would be mostly benefited from the 5G? I mean, uh, in other words, uh, which business sector would be most innovated you know, by 5G? So I think I heard that most, which business would be the most disrupted or? Uh, innovative. 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 Who's going to cap capture this more than anyone else? Uh, I think logistics. The logistics industries will, will, companies will see a lot of benefit from using, you know, 5G. I think the industrial sector, companies like ABB, Siemens, etc. I think healthcare, just massive. I can see a lot of potential with healthcare. I can see a world where we have to, this, 70% of healthcare costs are driven by lifestyle illnesses that are after the fact. Right. Imagine if you could flip that to preventive healthcare being 70% in the next 20 years. That would change the dynamic totally in terms of the Will cost we cost. still have CEOs and newscasters? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe board positions will start to go away because robots can do it, but CEOs will be there for a while. Yeah, they will. All right, uh, Rajiv Suri, uh, Nokia CEO, thanks so much for your Thank time you. today. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the speaker and moderator for inlining words and perfect moderation. Next on our program is...